Hello, everyone. Welcome to the closing session of Parkland Institute's 25th annual conference, Building the Future We Need, Hope, Transformation and Action. We're really pleased to have so many of you joining us uh, again for our closing session. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the amazing speakers that we've had so far. My name is Bill Kilgannon. I'm the executive director of the Parkland Institute. And uh, we want to start off uh, as we have for each of our sessions by first recognizing where we are. And uh, Parkland Institute uh, has been working uh, with all of our board and all of our networks to make sure that we are um, going through an, uh, our equity, diversion, and inclusion process and are looking at how we can make sure that all of our uh, events are recognizing our land our, and the treaty obligations that we're on. So I'm speaking to you from uh, Edmonton, which of course is on uh, Treaty 6 territory, but of course we have people from all across Alberta on Treaty 7 and Treaty 8 lands, and as well as uh, we know from across the country. So we acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Kainai, Pekani, and Sitsika, the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakota Sioux, uh, Stony Nakota, and Tsutsina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who have lived in and care for these lands for generations. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. We also want to thank all of our sponsors uh, who have made this possible. As you've heard throughout the, the conference, uh, there are many uh, great organizations who uh, have provided the financial support or, or logistical support. And of course, we are based in uh, the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta and receive great support from them. We have the financial uh, support and ongoing relationship with uh, the Alberta Federation of Labor, the Alberta Teachers Association, AUPE, QP Alberta, the Health Sciences Association of Alberta, the United Nurses of Alberta, Civic Services Union Local 52, the Non-Academic Staff Association at the U of A and NASA, and the Woodsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship. Both Alberta Public Interest Research Group and the Lethbridge Public Interest Research Group have been very active with us, supporting free registration for students in those universities, and our media sponsors are CJSR Radio and the wonderful Alberta Views magazine. We hope uh, all of you have registered for the conference or taking the, the code, special code, to get a, a subscription if you don't have a subscription to Alberta Views magazine. In addition to all of these sponsors, we've been very pleased to have uh, individual conference speakers uh, sponsored by different organizations. And today, uh, we uh, this uh, uh, talk, Alicia's talk, is sponsored by the Canadian Literature Centre, who we're very pleased to be working with. Uh, the Literature Centre uh, has been putting on all kinds of amazing events uh, for, um, as, as you can imagine, uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh, people who have been writing, and as we have for our speaker tonight. Uh, the Parkland Institute is also pleased to be partnered with uh, SKIP, at the University of Alberta, uh, SKIPP, the Situated Knowledge Indigenous Peoples and Places. And so, uh, who's also sponsored Pam Palmeter and, and, and um, the talk today. So I'd like to turn it over to Keisha Supernaut, uh, who is with Skip to say a few words about that and introduce our keynote speaker, Keisha. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Tanse, Kishi Supernaniti Katson, Namaskuchi Uskai Ganachinia, Lemachifnia. It is my pleasure to be with you today to introduce our amazing speaker. I am Kishi Supernant. I am the co director of the Situated Knowledges Indigenous Peoples in Place, uh, alongside Tracy Hillier, who is my other co director. This is a University of Alberta signature area. It is a network of Indigenous and non Indigenous scholars who are working on Indigenous 
disengaged research and teaching and really is about bringing together a community of practice to transform the way we do scholarship in the institutions to center Indigenous ways of knowing and being in the research and teaching that we do and to help build capacity to build good relations with Indigenous communities locally, nationally and globally. And we're very pleased to be able to sponsor this amazing talk today. So it is my pleasure to introduce the closing speaker of the Parkland's 25th Annual Conference. Alicia Elliott is Mohawk, a Mohawk writer living in Brantford, Ontario. She has written for the Globe and Mail, CBC, Hazlitt, and many others. She's had essays nominated for the National Magazine Awards for three straight years, winning gold in 2017. And her short fiction was selected for Best American Short Stories in 2018, Best Canadian Stories 2018, and Journey Prize Stories 30. She was chosen by Tanya Tagala as the 2018 recipient of the RBC Taylor Emerging Writer Award. And her extraordinary first book, A Mind Spread Out on the Ground, is a national bestseller. Alicia's talk today is titled, Why We Should All Be Activists, What Haudenosaunee Philosophy Can Teach Us About Our Responsibility to the Earth. And I know I, for one, am very excited about this extremely timely and important conversation uh, as Wet'suwet'en land defenders and matriarchs are being forcibly removed from their unceded territories. I think it's essential that we're exploring what Indigenous ways of knowing can be and can teach us about how we should all be activists. So Alicia, I want to say tawau, welcome, and I'm very much looking forward to listening to your talk today. Miao goa Kisha. Thank you so much for that introduction. My name is Alicia Elliott, and um, uh, as was mentioned, I'm a Mohawk from Six Nations, the Grand River Territory. Um, and I just wanted to mention just quickly, because, uh, we, we, I will talk about this a little bit more um, as I get into my talk, but I did want to just mention that um, uh, my community is very much in solidarity with what's happening at Wasowatin right now. Um, uh, two people from my community where we're currently um, embroiled in the land struggle um, called 1492 Land Back Lane. Um, Skyler and uh, Logan um, uh, have gone over to Wasowatin and they're there um, uh, in solidarity and have been arrested actually. Um, uh, as a result of being there in solidarity with this other nation. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's important that we um, are always aware of the people who are on the front lines doing this work, who are being criminalized um, and then having to pay for lawyers and having to pay with, um, you know, bail conditions and, and et cetera, so that we can um, even stay on land that even um, the courts in, in at, at least in the situation in Wet'suwet'en um, have acknowledged that there is a, a title problem. And so like Coastal Gas Lake doesn't necessarily have legitimate title to this area. And yet the court is still upholding this injunction and trying to make it so that indigenous people um, who are trying to defend their land cannot legally be there. And RCMP is enforcing this. So um, it's important, I think, for us to situate ourselves in that um, knowledge that this is happening right now and this is happening continuously um, throughout this country. And it is done so that this country can be considered stable um, in terms of uh, having control over all of the lands and resources and being able to do with it what people who are in power believe is necessary, which is continually extracting for corporate profit um, and the enrichment of few as opposed to helping all Canadians and Indigenous people. I want to start by talking about a book that's actually written by a Haudenosaunee um, Mohawk scholar and Professor Rick Montour called We Share Our Matters, Two Centuries of Writing and Resistance at Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, in it, uh, Rick Montour notes that the best writing from our territory has been nonfiction, which has arose during, quote, times of social and political crisis. He goes on to elaborate. It is during moments of conflict that the Haudenosaunee have drawn from our understanding of the oral traditions that sustained our ancestors for centuries, thought about them, argued over them, and ultimately given voice to them in diverse yet convergent ways. It does not matter what continually changes, our understanding remains certain. While Haudenosaunee thought in both oral and written form, is an expression of intellectual sovereignty and our unique cultural identity. It is also very much concerned with developing and sustaining a respectful dialogue with others in the world. 
We have a very long history in a particular geographical place to which we have given a tremendous amount of consideration. And our oral and literary traditions are therefore a means by which we share our matters so that all can learn and benefit from our experiential understanding of the natural world and humankind's place within it. I wanted to start with this quote for a couple of reasons. One is that um, the Haudenosaunee, or as outsiders have called us, um, uh, the Iroquois, have been painted in many books as bloodthirsty savages who specialize in warring and leave destruction in our wake. Uh, this is not ancient history. Um, you may recall Joseph Boyden's book, The Arenda, which won Canada Reads in 2014 and is still included in Chapter Indigo's um, Best Canadian Books box set alongside um, Canadian classics such as Anne of Green Gables and Lives of Girls and Women. Uh, in uh, The Arenda, my people are a shadow lurking in the woods, terrifying everyone, eventually even scaring Snow Falls, which is a woman who was originally Haudenosaunee but was adopted by the Hurons throughout the course of the book. Boyden wasn't the first to see our people this way and he certainly won't be the last. Contrast his depiction with the words in a Montour's quote, which I just, um, uh, which I just recited which showcases our generosity with our knowledge and our desire for dialogue. Contrast it with the Haudenosaunee symbol of the great tree of peace, which is central to our teachings. It's an evergreen tree with four white roots of peace extending in the four directions. If anyone wants to escape violence and war, all they would have to do is follow the roots of peace, uh, to the tree of peace to ask to seek shelter under its branches. Uh, this is considered Basically, it's sort of um, like as with a lot of our um, a lot of our teachings, it's very visual, very very metaphorical um, and poetic language. That's also um, legal kind of um, ideas surrounding, for example, immigration and things like that. Um, so contrast that depiction then <laughs> the depiction of us as as savages who even our own people are afraid of. Um, to our adoption policy, which allowed nations who accepted the great law to live on our territory and keep their cultural practices alive unharassed. The way that Montour sees our people, the way that I see our people is much different than the way that Canada has been encouraged to see our people. Um, and this continues to this day, as I mentioned with, um, you know, our, uh, all of our people who are land defenders being depicted as terrorists as far back as, um, uh, in, in modern times, as far back as the Caledonia or Ganestado dispute. Um, the other reason I wanted to start with this quote is because it positions Haudenosaunee nonfiction writing as being essential during times of conflict and Haudenosaunee people as willing to speak up and engage in conversation. Some may call this activism. I know that people have referred to me as an activist, which has always confused me. <laughs> I've seen my people shut down highways, put up blockades, take over housing developments, all while risking incarceration and criminalization from Canada and the police. My father has been followed by police when he leaves the reserve. My sister was monitored by CSIS when she was involved in activism when she was in her university years. My writing, while arising, arising often out of times of conflict, does not put me in the same danger as those who are on the front lines. And I wanna make sure that I specify that because again this is something that um is much more dangerous for people who are out there putting their lives and putting their bodies and 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 families on the line for this with this in mind though i want to talk to you uh, about indigenous literature activism in my own writing practice in hopes it will encourage reflection and hopefully hopefully <laughs> respectful dialogue um to do that though i i kind of have to talk about the haudenosaunee stories Haudenosaunee philosophies, um, the environment, treaties, and the way that all of us approach and interpret the world around us. It's a little bit of a circuitous route, I'll admit. Um, other Indigenous folks um, who may be listening probably are rolling their eyes at the thought of yet another Haudenosaunee person bragging about how awesome we are, but I promise if you stick with me, it will be worth it. Um, as a Mohawk woman from Six Nations, the Grand River Territory, I feel it's important to ground my work within my specific history as a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and as a caretaker of the land that my father's family has known for generations. 
It's an unfortunate side effect of colonialism that over 600 recognized First Nations bands and even more unrecognized nations and communities have all had to huddle under a vague term like indigenous. I know as much about the potlatching cultures of Coast Salish people as anyone seems to know about um, uh, about the, the treaties of this land, <laughs> judging by some media coverage. Um, but uh, I'll try to avoid making a fool of myself by focusing on what I do know, which is my own people and my own community, which is um, distinct and different from other communities who have very specific histories with the land that they're on um, and with their own cultures and, and, and so on and languages. Um, so a few years ago, my sister brought over wild onion soup. She said our father had made it. He'd walk down to Mackenzie Creek and pick the wild onions himself. In the years we've both visited the res, then eventually lived on the res, we've played in that creek, caught crayfish from it, grabbed snapping turtles from its murky depths and unsuccessfully tried to make them our pets. Um, we've balanced on the backs of tipped trees, turned makeshift bridges as we've crossed its narrow width. My father once made a fort out of reclaimed wood, logs, and trees right next to the Mackenzie Creek, which my brothers like to pretend was a fortress in Middle Earth as they were fighting off orcs. In all of this time, though, my father never taught us how to identify wild onions. He'd never made us wild onion soup, not even when we were on our last packs of food bank pasta and no-name cornflakes. I only recently found out my grandmother used to take my dad and his siblings to pick wild onions. She'd made them wild onion soup all the time to the point where my aunt would crave it, connecting it with warm memories from her childhood, with the warmth of her mother. This was knowledge she'd passed down to my father, knowledge, curiously, that he didn't pass on to me. I was pissed when I found out about this. Why didn't he ever make us the soup as kids? Why didn't he teach us more about the lands that our family had lived on for generations? By keeping this knowledge from me, I felt as if my father had kept my inheritance from me, leaving me nothing. Of course, this is what happens when indigenous knowledge and reciprocity is treated as savage, as stupid, unimportant, and worthless. Instead of being passed down lovingly into eager waiting hands, that knowledge is discarded, making space for the censored histories and lifeless science factoids Canada wants us to know instead. Few of us know the histories of the lands we live on. Even fewer know the responsibilities that we have historically had to that land. Um, this is what it means to be an indigenous writer living under a colonial government. You know there is a rich history that was yours to inherit, but it was stolen from you. This loss, um, as I, <laughs> I may have, have hinted, um, is intricately connected to the land. As a child, for example, I was born in Buffalo, New York, which was traditionally Seneca territory. In fourth grade, I moved to Mentor, Ohio, which was traditionally Erie territory, though the name Ohio itself comes from a Seneca word. From there, I moved again to where my father's family has deep roots, Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, Haudenosaunee Territory, my people's territory. It was hardly a paradise. I saw how municipal dumping in Brantford, which is just up the road basically from my reserve, had turned the Grand River in front of our res a murky brown. I learned how Indian agents used money in our community's trust to build a dam in Caledonia that kept the pollution from impacting the river in that city, which is primarily non-Indigenous um, and where a lot of white families live, uh, causing that pollution to come back down to the river and settle in front of our community. So basically it would go like um, Brantford dumps all of this stuff into the Grand River it goes down, it passes Six Nations, and it would settle in front of Caledonia, but Indian agents took our money without our consent and built a dam so that the, so that the, um, the pollution then um, basically goes down, past us to Caledonia, and then um, gets sent back and settles right in front of our reserve, 
which has made our water quality very terrible. There's um, uh, currently um, a, a respected university professor from Laurier who's doing intensive um, research into uh, the water quality on Six Nations um, because there are people who have developed rashes and, and such from using the water. Um, and we aren't even on a long-term water or short-term water boil, uh, boil water advisory, just to give you some insight into that. Um, I, I know that, or well, I know now, I guess, <laughs> that uh, the federal policies that allowed non-Native politicians to do this sort of thing, this, um, what I would call environmental racism, uh, still exist. According to Anishinaabe Ottawa consultant, Alan Clark, um, and this is a direct quote, the Crown still collects, receives, and holds a considerable amount of money, more than $676 million as of August 2016, on behalf of Indians because legal title to reserve lands still rests with the Crown, and federal bureaucrats continue to sign leases, permits, and licenses on behalf of First Nations. So the, this is still happening as recently as 2016, as recently as now um, in 2021. Uh, so I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm clear that this is something that like has not stopped. So when we have this idea of, um, you know, oh, why are you so angry about these things? Um, get over these things. These things haven't stopped. So it's hard to kind of um, to kind of uh, get over things when they're still happening. <laughs> um, uh, when I was in high school, living on on the reserve, I'd watch as I'd watched as a nearby housing development, um, a nearby or sorry, not a single one, numerous ones had encroached on our territory the way that settlers always did, as far back as um, the first time that Six Nations was instated, um, which <laughs> is um, kind of funny because uh, speaking back to like the way that we treated immigrants. Even then, when settlers were settling on territory that was supposed to be ours and the crown and their policing was supposed to push them off and be like, this is not your territory, um, we would never demand that they get kicked off. We would say, okay, well, you guys, um, we don't want to interfere with families. So, like, you guys can have this part of the territory. We'll sign that over. But, like, there needs to be leases. There needs to be money for this. This needs to be responsible. Um, and that, of course, um, fell apart and leases have not been honored. And um, the city that I'm in right now, Brantford, there are so many leases that have um, that have stopped or the payments did not continue and the people who were required legally to follow up on that didn't do so. So this is how um, land gets stolen um, from indigenous peoples, at least in, in my community's uh, case. So um, the thing that's interesting though about housing developments that are being encroached on, or that are encroaching on our territory is that um, Provincial and federal governments refuse to negotiate land back to us once non-native people are living on it. So if you consider that, then it makes it make much more sense why um, uh, my community in particular has tried to stop housing developments from being completed because this land that is ours that we have title to and everything um, that, our, uh, that the government has stalled for, um, I wanna say 40 or 50 years in terms of uh, pushing those legal cases forward um, to, to actually establish our title and everything like that. Um, they, they, they don't give us back any land at all if, if there are um, Canadians living on it. So that gives you some insight into that. Um, the thing is though, is that, you know, uh, despite the fact of uh, these problems that are involved with living on six stations, including water insecurity, food insecurity, um, housing shortages, which are um, uh, similar in um, varying degrees across all reserves in Canada. Six Nations is also more green than any community I've seen surrounding it. It's home to the single largest block of Carolinian, for or Carolinian forest in Canada. There are trees and cornfields and wild strawberry patches, a giant willow tree, which my father planted when he was a child uh, from a sapling now stands guard in my aunt's front yard, still holding an old tire swing after generations. I've always known my family and community were willing to fight for every inch of this land, even if it was polluted, even if it was being whittled down to a smaller and smaller territory every year, even if we'd lost ceremonies, our languages, even if our women no longer planted the three sisters in mounds in the center of our community, 
taking care of the land the way we did before contact. Even if it meant risking criminal charges and jail time, we would fight for that land. We knew it did not belong to us. It belonged to our children and our children's children. We had to safeguard their inheritance so that when I finally learned how to identify wild onions and make wild onion soup, there would be a space I could take my son and teach him how to do the same. Now, when I lived in Toronto for university, my lack of knowledge about the land finally struck me. I was living at the time on a, what is called dish with one spoon territory, a treaty that acknowledged my people, the Haudenosaunee, as well as the Huron Wendat and the Mississaugas of the credit. Um, uh, it was meant to be a space um, where all nations could eat from the same dish with one spoon, um, passing the spoon uh, back and forth, leaving knives away from the metaphorical dinner table so that this abundant territory could be a shared, neutral, sustainable hunting ground. Um, built right into that is the idea that you just take what you need, which is the, the idea of with the one spoon that you pass along. Um, but just like in Buffalo and Ohio, that place now lives with a sort of colonial amnesia. Just like many cities, Toronto doesn't acknowledge its pre-colonial past. Uh, very few of the people living there now acknowledge the land's pre-colonial past. And when I say this, I'm not talking about um, just territorial acknowledgements or land acknowledgements. I'm talking about upholding treaties that were part of the land's history. Treaties that have kept these lands and the ecosystem that relies on them healthy for centuries. I'm talking about imagining what it would look like for us to live in accordance with that treaty now, where we don't take more than we need from the land because we want to ensure there's enough for everyone else, not only now, but generations into the future. Um, some of you may be familiar with the idea of the seven generations. This is very uh, much in that mindset which um, the idea and philosophy surrounding that is just that um, what we do now is the result of decisions that were made seven generations in the past um, and what we are doing now, um, any decisions we are making now, specifically in regards to um, governance, land, water, um, any of these things is going to have ramifications seven generations in the future. Recently, uh, just to give you an idea of how far we are from that actual idea, the city of Toronto spent $2 million on policing to make sure that homeless folks were cleared out of public parks. This is, um, and, and I believe that um, it's it's more now actually, because they've had more, more things happening. So that was the latest um, information that I had, but it's definitely grown since then. Um, this, this was uh, done despite the city's knowledge that they do not have enough shelter space for the amount of homeless people in the city. This was also done after the city of Toronto took Khalil Sievright to court uh, to force him to stop building tiny shelters for homeless folks and placing them on what they call city-owned land. Um, literally, he was just building um, very small, tiny shelters for homeless people so that they wouldn't have to, so that they would have space. And um, the city took him to court and sued him to make him stop. Um, this is not, in case it's not abundantly clear in accordance with uh, Dish With One Spoon Treaty, which is ironic because of course the city of Toronto cites this treaty with every one of their own land acknowledgements. And this of course is the problem with land acknowledgements. Saying that this was traditionally Haudenosaunee, Huron, Wendat, and Mississauga of the credit territory in the past does not make my people, our history, or our contributions to these lands more visible today. It does not create a reality where we are collectively taking up our responsibilities to the land, to our neighbors who are trying to live on the land now, or to our descendants from whom we're merely borrowing that land um, in terms of uh, Haudenosaunee philosophy. Anyways, I know that this is not how everyone thinks of the land. Um, maybe we should though, <laughs> it's, um, kind of, anyway. <laughs> Uh, most land acknowledgments merely motion towards a vague past while simultaneously keeping us in a perpetual present, not considering what will happen to the land if we continue on our current course. Um, this is kind of, I think, uh, the way that colonialism and capitalism work, though, by keeping us in a perpetual present where we don't consider what's going to happen even 5, 10, 20 years from now, uh, which, as we're seeing with more and more um, scientific reports coming out 
seems to be increasingly dire because the climate crisis is not in the future. It is happening now and we are seeing the impacts now, um, even throughout Canada, as we've seen this past week. As a Haudenosaunee woman whose traditional responsibility is to be a caretaker of the land, a large part of my writing practice and an even larger amount of my reading has been about trying to recognize the history of the lands I call home, as well as lands that I visit. Educating myself and through my work, um, hopefully educating others about this history is how I attempt to decolonize the ideas we hold about land. Um, and as a Haudenosaunee woman, my traditional territory is on both sides of the border, um, which uh, you know is technically an arbitrary border that declares one country is the US and one country is Canada, and neither of these lands are Indigenous or Haudenosaunee, despite our long history of treaties, or in places like British Columbia, a long history of no treaties whatsoever, and therefore a long history of literally stolen land. So often in literature, I find settlers looking at land um, as terra nullius, which is a legal concept um, declaring that any land that is not um, Christian owned, basically, um, or ruled by Christian monarchs is empty land. Uh, they project their fears, the writers, um, uh, about nature uh, onto the land. There, there's fears that um, it's a space that they must conquer and control, deriving a sense of identity and self-worth from their ability to thrive in what they perceive as a hostile environment. In Canada, they use their ability to canoe, for example, um, originally an Indigenous method of travel, obviously, <laughs> um, as evidence that they belong on these lands, that the history of these lands started when Europeans arrived. This isn't the type of mentality that has been relegated to the ancient past either. Um, a couple of years ago now, I was editing the first ever creative, all creative nonfiction issue of um, the literary magazine, The Fiddlehead, which is based out east. Um, there were beautiful pieces that described the land in Canada, the plants that grow there, but then stopped <laughs> all attempts of chronicling the land's history when white people were no longer there. So they were like, this land is great. And they would talk about the history, but they would not talk about anything past one um, uh, non-Indigenous people arrived. So there's also um, to consider, I think, uh, travel writing in general, where people write about going to different countries and experiencing them as a tourist, not knowing necessarily what context they're walking into, um, whose lands um, they are traditionally, what those lands have seen and suffered, or considering whether, um, and I think this is an important one as well, um, particularly in Alberta, I'm thinking about um, uh, Banff in particular, um, you know, considering whether the beauty they're witnessing has only been spared development because people like them come for a chance to find themselves in beautiful lands. So the common thread here is thinking about and writing about the land as if we all still firmly believed in the Elizabethan great chain of being, this medieval hierarchy that placed God above all else, then angelic beings, then humanity, then animals, then plants, then minerals, which kind of brings up the question, why are we still insisting we're more important than all elements of creation, particularly when we rely on all those elements of creation to live? Why are we projecting our fears and insecurities onto land that has its own history, its own worth outside of what it means to humans? Um, Seneca scholar John Mohawk has uh, pointed to differing conceptions of nature as being one of the fundamental differences between Western or European thought and Haudenosaunee thought. Uh, to Europeans and, and European descended people, Nature is an unknowable, irrational, chaotic threat that needs to be tamed and controlled. You can still see this thought process played out in literature today, as I mentioned, um, but even just more broadly, one of the main classifications of narrative conflict in writing is literally man versus nature. Um, as John Mohawk points out, though, Haudenosaunee thought is quite different and considers, quote, the natural world as a rational existence while admitting human beings possess an imperfect understanding of it. 
there is such a strong belief in the rationality of the natural world that we as Haudenosaunee use it to structure our ceremonies and as such our lives. Um, there are 13 ceremonies which represent the 13 moons throughout the year from welcoming back the thunderers in April to strawberry ceremony in June, which celebrates the first fruit that appears um, every year after a long winter. Um, we just recently had the harvest moon, which um, signifies the end of the harvest before winter. So these are all ways in which um, the Haudenosaunee acknowledge in the words of Rick Montour that human beings are dependent on the natural world around them. And as such, it is their responsibility to give thanks daily. Instead of looking at land as a resource to be mined and plundered, what would happen if we considered it a gift to be thankful for every moment of every day? Um, I, I don't, um, I, I wanna talk about this in a little bit more detail, I guess, because I don't think we acknowledge um, enough that colonialism isn't the only system available to guide the way we live and look at um, life on this planet. Um, so I'm going to read from um, a, just a, a short paragraph from my book for a moment, because I think it's a good jumping off point for this discussion. Um, my people are the Mohawk, one of the six nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Our Confederacy Chiefs Council inspired the structure of American democracy. Our great law inspired the American constitution. We are people with a rich history with complex nuanced understandings of leadership, diplomacy, and responsibility. We are poets crafting precise, beautiful comparisons of the world we know in order to make the abstract understood. We are linguistic caretakers, piecing together the most precise descriptions of your ailments that we can, wanting to acknowledge what has happened to you without blaming you, working to make sure you feel understood. We are caretakers of the land and the waters, making treaties such as the dish with one spoon, a treaty that colors, covers all of Takaranto or Toronto. We made this treaty with the Anishinaabe, people who were historically our enemies, because all of our nations could acknowledge how bountiful these lands and waters were, and subsequently how easily through overhunting and other selfish practices, they could be drained and made into a dry husk. Um, those lands, and this is a little bit of a, a, a repeat, I guess, of what I had mentioned earlier, um, but bear with me, <laughs> those lands represented a dish which all of our people could take from and which we could continue or which could continue to be abundant as long as we eat with one shared spoon, even among enemies. What would happen if we use that metaphor and, philosoph and philosophy to govern how we treated all land in this country? if another system were implemented. I don't think you have to be Haudenosaunee or even religious to see the benefits in having this sort of long view of the world. Of course, the problem is um, there is no profit to be made if you're considering how a pipeline is going to impact our earth and our children's children's lives generations down the road. There is no money to be made if we consider the effects of allowing com companies like Nestle to bottle public well water as fast as they can and sell it back to the indigenous people whose lands they're pumping from, who have currently no access to clean potable water. Um, this is the, certainly the, the case in my community where Nestle was literally pumping from Aberfoyle, which um, is technically a uh, part of the, the tract called the Haldeman Tract, which was originally um, six miles on either side of the, the Grand River territory, which was, or the, sorry, the Grand River itself, which um, was technically um, granted to us after helping the Crown in um, the American Revolutionary War. So, um, you know, the, the fact that we are living um, in uh, on a reserve where we don't have any long-term or short-term water, boil water advisories, where in fact um, they did, um, the federal government did fund uh, a water treatment facility, but they didn't give us money for um, the actual infrastructure to connect all of the homes on our reserve to that water treatment facility, which means that despite the millions of dollars they poured into this facility, um, it's essentially useless for 90% of the reserve, which does not have access to that water treatment plant. And so that means that 90% of the reserve needs to rely on bottled water from companies like Nestle, which are pumping water from Aberfoyle on our own territory without our consent, and then selling it back to us where the government will not fund 
so that we don't have to rely on the ne on Nestle water for um, us to survive. Um, uh, you know, if we were to use kind of the concept of dish with one spoon, for example, um, and think that through um, in terms of what we approve, um, there would be no diamond mines, I don't think, <laughs> no coal mines, no monoculture farming, which obliterates the biological diversity of the land and destroys the soil. Um, so many elements of our modern society become completely irrational if before embarking on these ventures, we were to first consider the natural world we depend on to live and how these things would have um, impacts generations down the line. So coming from a community and a nation which has such fundamentally different values than those of Canada means that anything I say or write which upholds my people and our right to exist will in some way be viewed as dissent or to others, activism. Which brings me back to my hesitation to be considered an activist. Um, it took me some time to realize that the cultural differences between Haudenosaunee and Canadians actually explains this. As Haudenosaunee, we see speaking up and taking action as part of our responsibilities to our community, our children, and our future, and also our ancestors, I would say as well. It's simply part of our lives. We don't separate it into activism and complacency because we can't afford to. If we don't speak up, no one will speak up and this stuff will continue to happen unchecked. The land is a part of us. So to defend ourselves and our way of life, we must also defend the lands and the waters. Canadians, on the other hand, are encouraged to trust their leaders to make the right decisions for them when it comes to managing the waters, lands, plants, and animals we all depend upon. The problem, of course, is that Canadian leaders are not responsible to the people or the lands, but to capital and corporations. How can we turn this mountain into a profit? How can I help out this oil company or that corrupt Canadian company so they'll offer me a cushy consulting gig when this whole politics thing has run its course? Um, the, the sad thing is that um, this is not all at all out of line with Canadian values. At its core, Canadian identity is not bound up in taking care of the earth that takes care of them. In fact, for many Canadians, nature is often relegated to an extracurricular interest. Um, it's something to see, something to photograph, something to explore, but not something to protect and be responsible to. Those who interfere with unfettered access to nature and natural resources which are often indigenous people, um, but also non-indigenous allies um, in particular are very helpful in that as well. But uh, these, um, when they interfere with access to nature and natural resources, they're viewed with disdain, often labeled terrorists and always deemed threats to national interest, which begs the question, what is the national interest? To pump tar from the veins of the earth and sell it to refineries in America for a profit? Is that in the best interest of the people who live in this nation, on this land, both Canadian and Indigenous, particularly when we think about the effects which we are now seeing as a result of the climate crisis? Or is that in the best interest of corporate Canada, the nation state whose creation and colonization has always been intricately tied to corporations such as the Hudson Bay Company in 1602 or Coastal Gas Link over in Wet'suwet'en today? Now, let's take this conversation and move it into the realm of literature, because that's where I come from, so I, I know it a little bit more. Um, I've written before that the role of a national literature is to uphold the nation state, to make the nation and its inherent values in something into something solid and easily digestible for its citizens, so that they can view their country with pride and solidify their patriotism. While this isn't necessarily the author's intention, it most certainly is the effect. Um, Margaret Atwood has pointed out in her seminal book on Canadian literature, Survival, this um, exact thing. She writes, quote, the, symbol for, the central symbol for Canada, and this is based on numerous instances of its occurrence in both English and French Canadian literature, is undoubtedly survival. La survivance. I'm sorry, my French is terrible. <laughs> uh, it is a multifaceted and adaptable idea. For early explorers and settlers, it meant bare survival in the face of hostile elements and or natives. Essentially, then, what um, Atwood is saying 
is that the sort of Canadian literature that she was writing about um, and the sort of literature that was the start of Canlit, um, what's considered Canlit now, Canadian literature, are stories that show Canadians persevering over both nature and Indigenous people who are grouped together as the same anti-Canadian enemy. To circle back around and connect this to my people in my community, over 100 years ago, um, a Mohawk and English poet named Pauline Johnson came from Six Nations and became a literary celebrity across Canada. She was the daughter of a Confederacy Council chief and an English woman, um, and found that white audiences loved to see her perform and do speaking events and, and such. Um, the thing is, um, so she would recite poems, sing songs, and, and what I think is most interesting is wear this outfit that she constructed herself specifically for the occasion, which looked nothing like Haudenosaunee traditional um, ribbon skirts and things like that, our regalia that we would wear, but instead, looked exactly like the sort of primitive clothing a white person who had never encountered a real native person might expect her to wear. Um, Rick Montour writes that in the late 19th century, um, quote, Canada was attempting to create a literature that defined the new country in a way that set it apart, not only from England, but also the United States. Conscious of her unique identity as a Mohawk and English poetess, Involved in the process of literary nation building, Johnson once wrote that, quote, there are those who think they pay me a compliment in saying that I am just like a white woman. My aim, my joy, my pride is to sing the glories of my own people. It's important to note that Johnson wrote but did not say this sentiment in front of the audience that she relied on for her survival. Publicly, she often um, seemed to advocate for the same as, uh, assimilation that her people on Six Nations were actively campaigning against at that time. Um, in her version of assimilation, her people did not consider themselves um, politically autonomous or a group of sovereign nations. Instead, they were conciliatory loyalists to the crown. She once said on stage that if there were unpatriotic citizens in Canada, they are certainly not the Iroquois Indians. Another time, she said on stage, that you would be hard pressed to find a more, um, more Canadian men than our 50 chiefs who make up the Confederacy Council. I'm sure the chiefs would have been surprised to hear that. <laughs> uh, Johnson's assurances certainly didn't stop Canada from instructing the RCMP to overthrow our Confederacy Council at gunpoint in what was um, basically a coup um, and install a band council in 1924, not that much later than when. Um, Pauline Johnson said this. It's important to remember, though, that Johnson was a single Indigenous woman working in a white misogynistic industry uh, to not only support herself, but also her mother and her sister. Um, because she was the primary provider for her family, she had to have a mind for what would sell, what would please those who bought her tickets to see her perform um, and speak. As Montour says, um, the necessity to maintain a good working relationship with literary agents and publishers, and more importantly, audiences across Canada, required her to temper any moments of anger and outrage in her work with the calm reassurances of Native compliance to the larger mission of building a Canadian identity. Privately, though, Johnson often felt frustrated by her need to fulfill these audience expectations and because of her financially precarious position, she couldn't afford to stop performing for these audiences. This, of course, as um, a, a Haudenosaunee writer from Six Nations like her, who is also biracial, um, it, it makes me wonder what could Pauline Johnson have written um, or said or spoken in public if she wasn't worried about performing as the good Indian for Canadians? What range of thoughts could she have articulated if she wasn't worried the public would turn on her for going off script? Would she have been allowed to build up our nations, the Six Nations, instead of the nation that consistently told us our ways were strong, were, were uh, sorry, were wrong, stupid, or evil? These are the questions that haunt me. Um, there are moments where I see myself and my people in her sharp, straightforward words. Once she said, you are not, you're, you're going to say that I'm not like other Indians, that I'm not representative. That's not strange. Cultivate an Indian, let him show his aptness, and you say that he is an exception. Let a bad quality crop out, and you stamp him as an Indian immediately. 
this is the woman that I recognize, speaking truths that I recognize, just like so many women I know from Six Nations. When I think about activism in the literary community, um, I think about the words that Pauline Johnson said, despite the anger these words no doubt inspired in her white audience when she, when she said this. I think about the fact that many criticisms of Pauline Johnson made over a hundred years ago, um, or criticisms that she made, sorry, um, criticisms about cultural appropriation, about tokenism, the Canadian government, and how they are still relevant criticisms in 2021. Um, because she, even though, uh, despite all of this, she did write criticisms of the Canadian government, of representation of Indigenous women in particular in um, uh, books that were written by white people, primarily white men. But mostly I think about what she couldn't say because she needed to survive. And her survival in a racist industry and a racist society meant that she couldn't risk biting the hand that fed her and her family. And this is the story of survival that has fueled so much Indigenous writing within the genre we call can lit, not the Canadian narrative of white survival in the face of a hostile environment and even more hostile Indians, but a narrative of Canadians so offended at hearing about the violence their country and ancestors have enacted on Native people to ensure their survival, violence that has paved the way for them and their nation state to exist that Indigenous people have had to continuously censor ourselves when addressing it, hoping that if we make the word genocide sound sweet enough, that these people will stop denying our shared history, acknowledge what has been done, and finally, finally mobilize with us to make it right for the future. In my own writing, I try to acknowledge the history of Indigenous writing that has led me to this point, the writers like Pauline Johnson who have had to twist and turn and blunt and soften their words in the hope that white audiences would listen, would learn, would buy enough copies of their books that they might have a chance at another publication. I think of all the ways they had to censor themselves, to hold their tongues and stop their pens and smile through the dehumanizing rejections and ignorant, I have more of a comment than a question situations. I think about them not only because I feel grateful for what we they endured in order for me to stand here or sit here, um, but also because I deal with the same things today. Um, in times of crisis, Haudenosaunee have always spoken up, whether that's through letters to the government, public speeches, treaties, the writing down of our great law on our terms, poems, songs, essays, or editorials. According to Rick Montour, in an oral society, a speaker's ability to enlighten or, and convince people was and remains a very important talent. This is the role that Pauline Johnson took on in the late 19th century, and this is the role I'm trying my best to uphold today. I want this talk to enlighten and convince you. However, I will not do that by upholding the nation state of Canada in our work which I think um, I wanna make sure that I differentiate as a nation state that is different from the people that are that, may, that consider themselves Canadians. I think it's a very important that we differentiate between Canada, the, the nation state, the government and all of the systems within it and the people who live in Canada and call themselves Canadians. Um, I think that doing that is important because I, I think Canada relies on Canadians not making that differentiation and identifying with the nation state as opposed to saying like the people who are doing that are not me and so you know it creates these kinds of um, whirlwind divisions I think. Being an ally I think because this is something that we um, talk about a lot doesn't just look like all of you reading the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's executive summary, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girl Inquiries um, executive summary, or doing what you can to encourage the TRC's 94 calls to actions to be implemented. It doesn't just look like all of you reading the work of indigenous writers to learn the history of this country, though but all of those are great places to start. Being an indigenous ally, um, mainly in my opinion, means you need to think about the land, specifically your relationship to the land and how this country, its leaders and the corporations who fund those leaders should be treating the land. I say this because um, that's where discrimination and violence against indigenous people start, with the land. That's where it's continuing in land reclamation efforts today from my people in 19, uh, sorry, in 1492 Land Back Lane to Wet'suwet'en to Ferry Creek 
where RCMP are breaking Canada's own laws to ensure that resource extraction can continue uninterrupted. The land is where violence against Indigenous people will always be rooted. And if we don't start picking apart and addressing what divides us, our attitudes towards the land and each other, then we can't continue to encourage changes in policies, laws, and ideologies. So we can all eat from the dish with one spoon again. No need for knives, no need for poverty. I can't help but wonder if we stay this course, will we even have living descendants seven generations in the future? Or will the human race die out in a blaze of self-destruction, taking so much biodiversity, animals, and plants with us, a mere blip in the history of this beautiful, miraculous planet? I don't want that, and I don't think you want that either. I want my son to be able to pick wild onions and make wild soup for, or wild onion soup for his children. I want your children and your children's children to be able to be thankful for the world that we hand down to them, not resentful for the mistakes that we made and the destruction that we let happen. Considering the state of our world, the climate emergency that centuries of progress and Western civilization has created, and in particular, the state of Canada and its abysmal contributions to climate change amidst a climate emergency that is even now of impacting Canada, it's more important than ever that we all speak up against the sort of government that sees the world that sustains us as a resource to suck dry and spit out. It's more important than ever that we all think critically about the messages that we're putting out into the world and whether they're building up the future we want them to build up. If this is activism, then let us all be activists. We simply can't afford not to. Uh, thank you. Alicia, thank you so much for that incredibly insightful and, and powerful talk. Um, what a wonderful way for us to be wrapping up our 25th annual conference uh, with, your, with your incredibly wise uh, words. Um, we are now going to move to a question and answer. And I, just, I also want to invite uh, my co-host, uh, Marie Carrier, who is the Associate Dean of Research uh, in the Faculty of Arts and a member of our board, and actually the uh, uh, former director of the Canadian Literature Centre, an amazing writer in herself, to, to join us here in uh, Zoom land for the Q&A. Uh, and to kick it off while people are... Um, thinking about what questions uh, to ask Alicia. I, I was really struck uh, by your opening comments too about you know, the, the fact that uh, you as a writer are seen to be somehow a dangerous activist and yet others in your family are out doing frontline amazing work. But I think often poets, writers and what have you throughout history and uh, because you are bringing such powerful ideas forward are, are seen as activists. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about that sense of, of how important it is for writers, for artists, et cetera, to be expressing powerful ideas like you have here today as, a, as an artist and an activist. And then, and then hopefully we'll get some questions in the Q&A uh, for, for Marie and I to ask. Okay, over to you, Alicia. Well, I think it, it's interesting to consider um, sort of the history of uh, of writing because um, for I do think that writers do have the ability to um, you know um, evoke things to uh, to create something that's very moving. You know, I I think in particular for me, um, someone who was um, very influential in terms of how I thought about what um, literature could do and how it, it worked as a way of um, sort of being a sort of activism type thing is um, James Baldwin, who is um, a writer from America who was very involved in the civil rights movement. Um, he was a black gay man. And the fact that he was gay did, um, you know, set him apart, I think, from a lot of um, a lot of community and, and, and such. And I think that, you know, for a long time, he was um, he was not really given his due. I think that's more ha so happening now. But um, the way that, uh, you know, if you ever just um, feel like you're like, what do I want to hear someone speak so intelligently and articulately about race or about anything, really, if you just like stick, go into YouTube and, and, and type James Baldwin, you can, you'll come up with something brilliant. He's just um, has a mind on another level and his ability to articulate those thoughts so clearly um, to people. 
and um, in an accessible way where you don't need a PhD to understand what he's saying. Um, I think that that makes it especially um, urgent I, um, and uh, important, uh, that, that accessibility. Um, but I do think it's important to also note that, um, you know, we know this now, um, but uh, the, the, the CIA actually in the US um, uh, helped to develop what is now known as uh, um, writing MFA programs. Uh, the, the one that they primarily worked with was I think the Iowa Writers Workshop. And they created this idea of, um, of uh, like with them to create this idea of literature as um, being, you know, about plot, about character. You need to do these workshops and stuff like that. And in a way, um, they, they were trying to do that specifically to dull um, the literature of the nation so that it wasn't doing the same things as Russian literature was doing, um, you know, historically with Dostoevsky and, and things like that. Um, and instead, it was like, you know, we're going to write about, um, you know, things that aren't as um, are like if you had politics in your book, it's considered gauche um, or, you know, like uh, I, I've actually had um, <laughs> in, in a novel I'm working on now. People say things like me talking about things that are actually happening in the real world, pulled them out of the, the like pulled them out of the novel. And they were like, this is too realistic. This is like nonfiction, which is so strange when you think about it, because um, where did that idea come from? Well, it came from, uh, you know, the CIA. So, um, and, and the way that that kind of um, pinwheeled to create what we consider now in terms of literature and what is considered good literature as opposed to bad literature. Um, you can't be too prescriptive. You can't be too, you know, um, uh, too political or, or whatever, you know what I mean? So like, in, in some ways, the, the what's considered literary fiction is, is much less political than, um, uh, what we look at as genre fiction, so fantasy and sci-fi, post-apocalyptic stuff, even romance, uh, uh, um, more modernly, is is more political, I think, in ways um, because they don't have those sorts of hangups with what's considered good literary fiction. Um, and so, anyways, <laughs> I do think that it's very important for um, writers to do this, but I, I do think it's it's interesting to consider the context in which nations like the United States. Um, acknowledged that um, they didn't want uh, write their writers to think that good writing was critiquing the nation state, was being political and all of these sorts of things. And so now we're still kind of like dealing with the the fallout of that, um, especially in, in Canada, which is so closely aligned with the U.S., particularly in how it teaches creative writing in this country and MFA programs. Thank you so much for that answer, Alicia. We have a question from the director of the CLC, Sarah Crofts, who uh, says, thanks so much for your talk. You began with a story about food. Pauline Johnson also wrote about food. I'm thinking about poems like The Corn Husker and The Cattle Thief. Other important Indigenous thinkers like Leanne Betasamasaki Betis Simpson, for example, also connect food um, with decolonial ecologies. Could you tell us more about the role that stories about food can play in shifting all of our relationships to the land? Yes, we do have stories about food. Um, and I think that that's um, probably the, the case in all cultures is like this, this connection to food. I, I'm very fascinated in the ways that, um, you know, that, that different cultures um, develop their cuisines and things like that and how they, um, what they consider in relationship to that. I, I think that one of the things that's interesting is that, you know, um, all of us need food to live and therefore, you know, um, uh, there has to be some sort of understanding that, um, that there needs to be um, this idea that we're above plants or animals is, is kind of ridiculous when we, you consider that we need all of this to live. Um, and I, I, while I think that those, um, those stories are, are good and, and, and help us think about things differently. Like, for example, in my community, we have stories about like, um, you know, the three sisters, which we are, we consider corn, um, beans and squash, which are, um, which funny enough, um, they, they found later that like, this was like what we were like, this is our, our, our diet. These are the, like so important to us that we consider them our sisters, um, because they care for us so much and, and sustain our nourishment. What I found interesting is that later um, they found that uh, a diet that primarily consists of corn, beans, and squash gives you all of the nutrients you need to have a healthy diet, even if you don't have um, access to meat at certain points or whatever. So I think that, you know, those sorts of things are interesting when you think about um, what, um, 
what indigenous knowledge has and how did we like figure out that this was a the, the like the 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 foundation for a very healthy diet um and then what does it mean then when um we are put in situations by colonial governments where we cannot do those sorts of things anymore where they are not considered um good and so therefore we are not farming in the way we used to now we farm in um in very particular ways that were um created by Westerners um, for very for their types of foods that they considered um, good and that they wanted. Um, so, you know, thinking through some of that stuff, I think it's important to also contextualize um, what food means in terms of not having food security or, for example, um, having hunting rights, but then like which my community has, but then every single year without fail, at short hills when our um when our people go like they have a, a set amount of time every year that they're allowed to go into the the short hills park which is considered a provincial park and um carry out hunting for the for the year and every single year without fail there are white hunters who show up who bang on their doors who are um who have signs who complain and all of this stuff and basically are um it's, it's racist, you know what I mean? Like this idea that we are not allowed to have these things, which literally is all we have is just this, um, this guarantee that we can go into this park to, to hunt for our community, for us to survive like the winter in, in ways that, you know, we make it easier for us so that we don't have to worry about the fact that our community has no grocery stores on it. And that you need to go and like drive 20 minutes in either direction to get a grocery store. You know what I mean? So like these are ways that indigenous communities are specifically um, like our relationship to food is severed by colonialism. Um, and, you know, the fact that, for example, uh, women in my community used to be the farmers primarily. And it was the men who would go out um, hunting. We would be at home and we would be farming. We would cr be creating the gardens and taking care of the children. And um when uh, after the war, like the World War II, when the when men came back, they were like, and World War One actually specifically, um, they came back and they were like, we don't know what to do. We're supposed to be farming now because this is what the Indian agents have told us that we're supposed to do. And they've given us like they've said we have to set out farms like this, which is not like how we traditionally had our um, our farms set up uh, or our communities set up. And we're doing the roles that were assigned to women. Um, so that means like, what are the women supposed to do? And also we're not hunting now. So like this totally changes the ways that um, a, a community functions and the ways that people conceive of themselves in, in terms of what their roles are in the community. Um, and it was only because of uh, someone named um, Handsome Lake who was considered a, another Haudenosaunee um, a kind of prophet essentially. It was only when he came out and basically said, we have to do what we have to do essentially to survive. And um, we can, um, like our, our culture is changeable and it, it can still be ours and still be true. Even if we change our, we have to change these things to survive that we were able to move past that. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's super important that we talk about like stories of food, but we also talk about ways that um, colonialism and capitalism have interrupted our food supply. Um, even thinking about, you know, um, in the north, in um, northern Ontario, none of it, um, the, the ways that they are, you know, um, uh, told that they're not supposed to hunt in the ways that they were supposed to hunt. Um, primarily, um, I'm thinking about Inuit and seal, um, which, you know, animal rights activists have been very, very um, adamant that they sh should not hunt seal, even though they were hunting um, at much more sustainable levels than um, non-Indigenous people who are hunting the same thing and who had um, more ethical ways of, of, of killing the seals because they knew how to do this. They had been doing this for centuries. Um, they're not able to do that anymore. They're not able to have um, the same things. And so they all they have to rely on are flown in foods that have an, um, a cost that reflects that, where in the North, um, I believe I was looking at statistics from 2019 that said that uh, for a family of four, for groceries every week, it would be $466 per week to feed a family of four, considering all of the, the inflation and all of that stuff. What would have happened if they were able to just like, you know, hunt the way they were before? And thinking about climate change, what does that mean in terms of 
not being able to hunt in the ways they were before because these animals, um, the, the animal populations are fluctuating and having to leave and find new places to live because of the climate emergency that we're currently in. Um, so anyways, <laughs> you know, I think that was like a, a roundabout way of answering that. But I think that it's important that we, we think about this because, um, you know, the way that we eat food right now is not, um, is not good for the planet. You know, the fact that we can have avocados at any time of the year being flown in and stuff like that, that creates a lot of, um, you know, uh, a lot of pollution and stuff like that. And so I, I think that, you know, we do, we should all be considering ways that we can have more sustainable um, uh, ecosystems in terms of eating um, and what that would look like. Thank you, Alicia. So we do have uh, time for one more question. And I think I'm going to attempt to to ask uh, two questions in one. In one <laughs> they both they both are uh, pointing towards asking you for um, uh, recommendations in terms of, of reading. And so let me begin with uh, Trevor Zimmerman, who thanks you as well, and uh, says that uh, they recently read Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher, and it helped uh, me see some of the ways pop culture reinforces the dominant economic ideology. Your talk reminded me of this in some ways. Do you have more thoughts, recommendations for literature or other media that can help Canadians see how we are taught colonial ideology through culture in the hopes of rejecting it? And a similar uh, question was posed by Joyce Pui Peretta, who um, was also asking whether you could provide additional resources for allies for supporting land back, TRC, missing or uh, death of Indigenous women and people and every child matters, etc., aside from what has been provided on government uh, sites. And so just, just pointing towards uh, recommendations you might have at this time. I am going to post into the chat just now, actually, um, a link to the um, the legal fund for um, 1492 Landback Lane because they have to pay lawyers fees um, for all of them that get arrested. And um, they are arrested according to an injunction, which um, is, uh, it, the injunction is given regardless of whether, like they don't, um, the corporations don't have to prove the legitimacy of their title um, for the injunctions to be passed by um, ju uh, judges and enforced by police. And I think that's really important to discuss because, um, you know, especially when we're talking about what's happening out in Wet'suwet'en and Fairy Creek, any, um, basically any land um, site, land reclamation that's happening out in uh, what's considered uh, British Columbia or called British Columbia is that they don't have underlying title. And this is a problem that has been acknowledged by the S Supreme Court and was acknowledged by the court that gave the injunction. And yet they were saying, well, you know, this millions of dollars, because it costs millions of dollars to, to put um, the Supreme Court case that, that determined underlying title in one part of BC, um, and only for them to say, well, we have to have a retrial, which like they did say, yes, uh, we can't prove that we actually legally own any of this, but we should probably have a retrial for it, which again, then that puts Indigenous nations in the position where they have to pay millions of dollars in legal fees to do the same thing when this trial was already 374 days long, longer than a full calendar year. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, I, I think it's important to, um, one of the main ways that a lot of these um, people are, uh, are doing stuff is through their Twitter accounts that they're putting out information. There also is um, links um, pro uh, to um, different places where you can send money if you, um, if you have the money to be able to send for particular costs that are needed or things like that. I think those are really good ways to do things on the ground. Um, and, um, you know, if you were to, you know, just search on, hang on, let me, I, I can't find it right now off the top of my head, but like there are certain, um, uh, like just search on Twitter for, um, you know, Wasoatin for, for Fairy Creek and you can find their um, official Twitter pages and they will have information posted about ways that you can help them. Um, and, or even if they have like Amazon wish lists for things such as like, you know, camping equipment or like, you know, stuff they need to survive the winter while they're staying there. Um, things like that. So I think that that's um, a good way to do that. In terms of the other question, um, I, I always say, that I always think that it's important to read um, uh, Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, um, which I think is a very good foundational text that talks, that looks at the ways that all aspects of colonization kind of 
impact um, people who are colonized and, and uh, benefit the people who are um, the colonizers in, um, uh, the, in the context of culture and, and all of these things like violence and all this stuff, like it's very comprehensive. So I think that that's a, a good one. Um, and I'll just type that in there. Um, uh, and then also anything by Arthur Manuel. Oh, sorry, I spelled that wrong. It's um, Manuel. Um, he has two books out um, uh, that are pertinent to, I think if you wanna talk about just uh, the history in Canada of these sorts of um, things, he was like um, such a an important, well, his father um, did so much in terms of setting up the, the United Nations um, uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And then he himself uh, uh, basically was like a, a big um, uh, proponent of making it so that there was a section in the Canadian Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms that, um, and, and, and the Constitution that um, made it so that Indigenous people uh, and rights were affirmed. And he did that in a very particular way. So um, looking at that, that's in his first book. His second book is um, the the Reconciliation Manifesto, or I, I believe, and so it talk it's more current and talks about a lot of things. So reading both of those, I think, is um, very very important. And then I'm just gonna put um, Mohawk Interruptus. I think I spelled that wrong, um, <laughs> but um, that's another good book that's written by um, actually a Mohawk person who talks about these sorts of things. These are kind of books that are um, much more nonfiction. So like. Um, uh, not as like, you know, not as fun to, <laughs> to read, but like there are important books that, that give you a lot of information um, if that is what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, um, uh, and yeah, I think that in terms of if you're wanting to learn ac actual history, reading these kinds of nonfiction books um, are super important. Oh, and I'm just gonna write two, um, Peace and Good Order. Um, that's another good book um, by Harold Johnson, I wanna say. Um, who actually is an Indigenous man who used to be a lawyer for a large period of time and then now is reflecting back on um, what peace and a good order actually mean in the context of Canada, especially in terms of Indigenous legal systems and how it um, negatively impacts Indigenous people particularly. So he's coming from a perspective that's really interesting as well as someone who used to actually be um, uh, someone who worked for the Crown to prosecute these sorts of cases against primarily Indigenous people. Um, so that's also a really good um, resource, I would say. Well, thank you for that. That was a very generous answer. And I'm sure that people really uh, appreciate the recommendations that you've included in the chat. So so thanks so much, uh, Alicia. This generous answer that you uh, just gave really reflects the, you know, the overall generosity of your talk. And, uh, you know, at the end of the talk where you reminded us what it means uh, to be an Indigenous ally in terms of thinking about the land and, and how the land should be treated. Um, I think this is really a, a crucial uh, a reminder at this time. So thank you for that. Um, you've inspired, I think, many of us and certainly me uh, in thinking about uh, our relations and our responsibilities uh, to the land, to each other. Uh, to be proper and fuller humans uh, at this at this time, uh, and you know also the need the need for uh, indigenous and in this case uh, Haudenosaunee worldviews and ways of doing, uh, so that we can find a way out of of the climate mess that colonialism has has put us in, and so that we can mobilize together. Uh, and so I think these are just, again, really crucial uh, things for, for people to, to take away. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and so I think I'll pass it over to my colleague, Bill. Thank you, Marie, for all the support here and, and to you, Alicia, again, for an amazing talk and amazing wrap up for our 25th annual conference. I truly hope that those of you who've been through all of our amazing speakers uh, are feeling hopeful, recognizing that hope comes from, from action, as we've heard from uh, whether it would be Pam Palmiter, uh, Maud Barlow, when she was speaking with the youth activists, that really through our actions, we show to others what can be done and we empower ourselves and we, uh, we inspire others to, to take actions. So, uh, we've had very deep conversations. Uh, I hope uh, you've all felt 
very challenged as well by uh, all of our speakers in terms of the challenging times that we have ahead of us. But again, uh, it is ultimately through action and through our hope that we are able to transform things uh, going forward. Uh, just a few closing things. Again, a huge thank you to all of our sponsors, in particular for Thalysia's talk for the Canadian Literature Centre and to Skip for sponsoring uh, this closing session. Uh, I do want to have a big shout out to all my staff who, of course, have worked incredibly hard to uh, make this all happen. Our programming committee of uh, board members and, and others that have come together to plan this amazing conference. Uh, we've talked extensively about all our sponsors uh, for uh, making this happen. A huge thank you to all of our speakers, uh, again, to you, Alicia, to uh, uh, Pam Hometer, to Kate uh, Rayworth and, and Ben Gesselbrecht, Jim Stanford, Maude Barlow, uh, Sadie Vipon and Harun Ali. Uh, a huge thank you as well to all of you who've joined us. Uh, it's so sad that we can't be all together in person uh, again for our second year. I am really hoping, as I'm sure you all are, that uh, we will be able to get together soon. Uh, Parkland Institute is hosting uh, a major national conference on implementing a just transition coming up in February. So we're very excited that we got a, a grant and some support from, from our allies to be uh, hosting that event in February. Look forward to that. And we really hope that our annual gala dinner event can take place in person here in Edmonton. So lots ahead of us. Uh, if you haven't already signed up to our email list off our website or donated, we really appreciate that. And with that, I want to bring to a close our 25th annual conference. Again, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your weekend.